Hi, my name is Judd Lasberg. I'm an associate clinical professor at UCSD School of Medicine. Um, one of my favorite topics to teach about is biventricular heart failure. Um, in a very short overview, I'd like to discuss with you what I consider the biggest misconception in the management evaluation of biventricular heart failure, which is understanding how left heart failure causes right heart failure. It's not back pressure. So right now I just want to talk about the pathophysiology of left heart failure, or what I like to call biventricular heart failure, highlighting the biventricular heart failure reflex. So the definition of heart failure for pulmonologists is very simple. LVEDP over 15. When LVDP goes over 15, a slew of neurohormonal effects are initiated, leading to biventricular heart failure. So let's talk about normal filling pressures in the heart for starters. So LVEDP, normal is 6 to 12. When we achieve an LVDP of 15, we are clearly abnormally elevated. Now, at this point, when LVDP reaches 15, there is direct back pressure transmitted to the left atrium, which directly transmits back pressure to the pulmonary venous system. But that's where back pressure ends. And at 15, a neurohormonal reflex is triggered causing pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction in tone to ensure that pulmonary artery pressure always remain higher than pulmonary venous pressure because forward blood flow through the lungs requires that pulmonary artery pressure always be higher than pulmonary venous pressure. This is called the waterfall effect or phenomenon and it's because the pulmonary capillary bed is subject to startling forces in its elastability and distensibility. So if we have over here pulmonary artery pressure and over here pulmonary venous pressure, the misconception is that this is a straight line of rigid pipes and that as pulmonary venous pressure goes up, it directly is transmitted to the pulmonary artery. This is not correct. The pulmonary vasculature in its distensibility behaves like a reservoir such that for this reservoir to fill and generate back pressure, first forward flow has to stop. This does not occur. Instead, as pulmonary venous pressure rises greater than 15, a reflex that is still not well characterized involving serotonin, prostacycline, and dithelium causes immediate or in a quarter of a second uh, increase in pulmonary artery tone so that pulmonary artery and pulmonary venous tone march together. Now, back pressure is important in heart failure for the pulmonary edema. So, as pulmonary venous pressure goes above 15 and PA pressure starts to rise, and then RVEDP rises, and then CVP rises, we start to get peripheral edema. So biventricular heart failure starts before any thoracic fluid. That's the first problem. The first problem with the misunderstanding about back pressure is if you see somebody with pulmonary hypertension, no thoracic edema, and peripheral edema, you would assume this has to be pulmonary vascular disease if this was back pressure because where's the thoracic fluid? But as you can see, while this reflex ensures forward blood flow, it also is protective against thoracic edema, so that as the heart fails, you develop peripheral edema well before pulmonary edema. In fact, the last space in your body that's gonna fill as we go over LVDP right now is the alveolus, is the organ of gas exchange. All right, so we're gonna continue heart failure, but the first manifestation of biventricular heart failure is
pulmonary arterial hypertension, RV failure, and CVP all happening, elevated CVP all happening well before thoracic edema. But patient continues to eat salt and continues to be in heart failure. So LVDP rises. The next important number is the number at which you can confidently attribute all the thoracic edema you're seeing to cardiogenic edema. So when do the lungs begin to flood? At 18. So when LVDP continues to rise past 15 despite the RV no longer filling the LV as much since it's in failure, uh, we start to get interstitial edema at 18. Then, if things continue to go poorly, we get alveolar edema at 25. So, um, understanding the order of fluid accumulation with pressures is very crucial because it's relevant to the removal of fluid also. So, the next most valuable aspect, I think, of this teaching is understanding the importance of pleural effusions. So pleural effusions are pathognomonic for biventricular heart failure because they require both an elevated LVDP over 18 to get fluid into the pleural space and an elevated RVDP over some number that's not been totally worked out in man. In sheep it's 15 at a CVP of 15 in sheep. Thoracic lymphatic drainage stops so fluid enters the pleural space when LVDP is over 18, and it fails to be cleared from the pleural space as CVP, RVP, RVDP and CVP rise. So the most challenging decision in man, do I have isolated right heart failure from biventricular heart failure in an edematous patient with pulmonary hypertension is made easy if the patient has bilateral pleural effusions because they require both left and right heart failure. Finally, fluid removal. So in a patient that has alveolar edema, interstitial edema, bilateral pleural effusions, ascites, and you're diuresing them, how did the fluid go away? Your body has easiest access to your peripheral interstitial edema. It exists in nearly a perfect equilibrium with the vasculature. It's why it's there, to maintain your, vasculator, your circulating vascular volume. So um, in this patient who is full of fluid, as we diurese them and LVDP falls, the first place fluid goes away is the alveolus. So if you are watching a patient, peripheral edema goes away and fluffy alveolar infiltrates persist, that's not cardiogenic edema. It's not possible to resolve the peripheral edema while you are um, having persistent cardiogenic alveolar edema, unless the patient is pretty much infarcting in front of your eyes, having transient elevations of flash pulmonary edema, which can happen. Next, the interstitium of the lungs will clear. But then we're not gonna come back to the thorax for a while because we're not gonna get rid of those pleural effusions until all the peripheral interstitial edema is, evolved, is resolved because the vasculature has much better access to your peripheral interstitium than it does to the pleural space. So patients will be diarrhoid of all of their pitting peripheral edema just prior to the effusions resolving and sort of two, three, four days past um, the resolution of peripheral edema. Ascites will be last since it's a lot like the pleural space, except it doesn't have those thoracic lymphatic drains. So all it's got is serosal to serosal contact with a maximum of absorption of something like 1,200 cc's in 24 hours. And you can stay tuned. That's how you separate end-stage heart failure and end-stage cirrhosis from decompensating. End-stage means making more than a diuresable amount of peritoneal fluid in a 24-hour period. So in conclusion, the false belief that left heart failure causes right heart failure from back pressure leads to three critically flawed assumptions. Number one, that a single simultaneous pressure measurement of left and right heart failure, of left and right heart pressures is enough to rule in or rule out heart failure. Intermittent LVEDP elevations, like those that occur at night in a patient with untreated sleep apnea who is tachycardic and hypoxemic and suffering 
a horrible diastolic filling abnormality at night in their own bed with elevated LVDP may only have a mild diastolic filling abnormality in your lab um, during the day when they're not having their sleep disordered breathing. Um, yet the pulmonary vasculature uh, will still respond to 12 hours of LVDP elevation with the biventricular heart failure reflex. Number two, patients with peripheral edema and no obvious thoracic fluid will be assumed to have primary pulmonary vascular disease or core pulmonale. This is also not true. Number three, there will be an anticipated tight link between the degree of LVDP elevation and pulmonary artery pressure elevation, such that patients who have a modestly elevated LVDP and a severely elevated PVP will thought to have an additional disease of pulmonary vascular remodeling requiring pulmonary vasodilators, when in fact, the reflex, the biventricular heart failure reflex by which elevated pulmonary venous pressure leads to pulmonary, uh, elevated pulmonary arterial pressure, has a huge variability in the human population. So an LVDP of 23 may give a patient a pulmonary artery pressure of 35 or 99 because of individual variability in that reflex. Uh, this reflex individual variability also explains the phenotypes of heart failure. Patients with disproportionate right-sided symptoms have a very robust reflex. Patients who present with pulmonary edema and pulmonary edema have a more blunted reflex. Um, it is my hope that this understanding of heart failure will help you clinically almost every day at a patient's bedside um, when evaluating uh, edema, volume overload, exercise limitation in patients with elevated pulmonary artery pressures. Thank you for your time.